Tonight, it's a totally different kettle of fish. And I'm afraid it's going to be a hair-raising week. So, I would beg you to bring a few seat belts along and fasten them. Because, as the introduction said, we build. And we build. Which means it gets bigger and worse as we go along. So I apologize for that. And most of all, I apologize for what I'm going to say. I think we are living in the most interesting times in the history of the world. And even the Bible says that the patriarchs and the prophets of old longed for this day that we are living in. It really is a fascinating time. But I know that if you tell the truth, there will always be those who are hurt by the truth. And I want to assure you that I belong to that category. I was hurt by this truth, very hurt by this truth, very angry about this truth. And so you're welcome to be angry with me. But don't be angry with the truth. Because if it's truth, then it's worth buying. If it's not truth, how do you determine whether it's truth? Well, there are only three definitions of truth in the Bible. The one says that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And the second truth is, thy word is truth. And in Psalms 119, all thy commandments are truth. Those are the only three definitions that we have in the Bible. And test everything I say by the word. Because I'm not going to indoctrinate you. I'm going to give you facts. And then you look at the facts, and you see whether the facts correlate with the word. And if they do, buy it. If it doesn't, reject it. So tonight, if you feel that you are being trodden on, that's not my intention. The truth will set you free, and the truth is a cleaver that cleaves to the marrow and to the bone. And it costs something. It is not free. Salvation is free, but it costs something. And how much does it cost? The Bible tells us what it costs. It costs everything you have. Everything. When you dig in that field, when you dig in that word, and you discover the treasure, which is beyond human comprehension, you go and you sell how much? All. To get the treasure. It's free, but it costs you something. Right. The twin pillars of the Reformation. I'm going to let history talk tonight. This is a history lesson. And therefore, please see it as a history lesson and not as an attack on anyone. And before I even start, let me say that I believe, and I believe it with all my heart and with all my soul, that God has His people in every single denomination on the planet. Did you understand what I said? I believe that God has his people in every single denomination on the planet. I'll go further. God has people in every single walk of life and religion on the planet. And he says that if you do not know something, the time of ignorance God winks at. But if you know and you do it not, then it be for you sin. So, I'm not knocking anyone. I'm just telling you what history tells us. So, what is the Reformation? What is the Reformation all about? Or what was it about? Is it some event that took place 400 years ago? And people have forgotten it. Well, today we still have Protestant churches, don't we? Don't we have Protestant churches in the world? 
How many of us belong to Protestant churches, may I ask? There are quite a couple of hands that are going up. May I be very naughty and ask another question? Uh, what are you protesting against? <laughs> well, we've had quite a few hands. And uh, if you ask that question, it brings a little chuckle. Because really, nobody is protesting anymore. Because I believe that Protestantism has been virtually eradicated. And we need to know why the Reformers were Protestants. Now, what does it mean to be a Protestant? You know, it has this negative image. You're protesting. No, Protestantism is not only negative, it is also positive. And if it were not positive, then it were, wouldn't be Protestantism. Well, let's have a look at this definition. It says, Protestantism has a positive and a negative meaning. Pro means being for something. And testari, to bear witness. So a true Protestant is a witness for the truth. That's what it means to be protestari, to be a Protestant. And that which is simply a negation of error is not true Protestantism. The true Protestant will bear primarily a positive message. His attitude will be that of his master who said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, that doesn't mean that error mustn't be exposed. But you expose error by means of truth. You must be protestari, and the protestari exposes the error. Now, when did things start to go wrong in this world? And why was it necessary to have a protestari and a protest? Well, it all started off long ago in history. There was a man by the name of Augustine, and he wrote a book, The City of God. And in this book, Augustine expounded a theology that the church was the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God found its reality in the church. So the theology of Augustine places the emphasis on the church as the kingdom of God, declaring that Christ was already reigning with his saints, and that the resurrection was of dead souls to spiritual life. So there was a mythology involved here. The church was encouraged to assume the rulership of the nations and instead of carrying the gospel to the world, church leaders began to seek prestige and power by political intrigue. And the result was the Dark Ages. So here you have this mega structure developing trying to incorporate the entire world as the city of God, the kingdom of God as it were. And that which is in the Bible about the coming kingdom and about a death and a resurrection was spiritualized away to fit into the confines of this theology. Well, as this power base grew in the world, voices started arising, complaining about the state of affairs. And one of the first voices was that of the Valdenses. And the Valdenses were ruthlessly persecuted. There are some that say the Valdenses only came here around the Middle Ages. No, they can be traced back right to the beginning, to the 4th century, even to the 3rd th century, some say. So the Valdenses gave a clear witness against Antichrist and said the system had become an Antichrist system. Joachim added his voice and the books of Daniel and Revelation became important. And then the morning star of the Reformation, Wycliffe, rose up and started adding his voice to that of the Valdenses and the others before him. This message went from England and it came to the Hussites via the students of Wycliffe. And there this great movement started in those countries like Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic today and those central European nations. This message was ruthlessly suppressed 
And then it surfaced again with the great reformers Luther, Knox, Calvin, Baxter, Cranmer. Some of these names are well known and some of them have been lost in the sands of time. You know, if you speak about the Cranmers and the Latimers and the Rogers of this world, huh? who's that? Well, I think it's time that these names were resurrected. Something surely must happen. Now, the Reformation rests on two discoveries. And this is what fueled the Reformation. Now, the first discovery is obvious. That's the discovery of Christ the centrality of Christ, the centrality of the Word, the centrality of salvation in Christ. That was the pillar on which the Reformation stood. And it got a few you know, power words like sola Christos, Christ and Christ alone. Sola gratia, saved by grace and grace alone. Sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. These are the great watchwords of this tremendous discovery. And the second one was equally important in binding the Reformation together. Of course, without the message, it couldn't stand at all. And that was the discovery and the identity of the Antichrist. And this is what bound the whole reformatory movement together. This is just historic fact. So the discovery of the all-sufficiency of Christ rested on the Word of God, the Bible, and the Bible alone, which provided the weapons of warfare. And the discovery of the identity of the Antichrist united the Reformation in opposition to this perceived common enemy. And that was the basis which fueled the Reformation. It's interesting that on the first point, there were differences amongst the Reformers. Sometimes hectic differences, and uh, they were at loggerheads on many of the details of the plan of salvation. But when it came to the identity of the Antichrist, they were at unison, every single one of them. We read in Grattan Guinea's famous book, Romanism and the Reformation, and you know, I'm going to quote a lot from history tonight. Old history. History that has been lost in the sands of time. Some of this history cannot even be found in modern textbooks or encyclopedias. Many of these books have been rewritten to take out the sting. So if you want to get to the real history of what happened, you have to get to those moldy books. You know what a book smells like when it's old? It has that moldy smell to it. And uh, that's what you need. Well, he writes, and I'm going to quote him. The Reformation of the 16th century which gave birth to Protestantism was based on Scripture. It gave back to the world the Bible, it taught the Scriptures, it exposed the errors and corruption of Rome by the use of the sword of the Spirit. Now this was written 120 years ago. It applied the prophecies and accepted their practical guidance. Such reformation work requires to be done afresh. We have suffered prophetic anti-papal truth to be too much forgotten. This generation is dangerously latitudinarian, indifferent to truth and error on points on which Scripture is tremendously decided and absolutely clear. Now here was one of the last great reformation champions, Gratan Guinness. That generation is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, why have we become dangerously latitudinarian? He writes, Our reformed faith is thus endangered both from without and from within. And it can be defended only by a resolute return to the true witness borne by saints and martyrs of other days. We must learn afresh from the divine prophecy. Notice the emphasis they put on prophecy. God's estimate of the character of the Church of Rome, if we would be moved afresh to be witnesses for Christ as against this great apostasy. You know, this sounds like something of bygone days, something that has to be forgotten, this hatchet has been buried. What is all this hype about? 
we feel constrained to renew the grand old protest to which the world owes its modern acquisition of liberty, knowledge, peace, and prosperity. We recognize it as a patent and undeniable fact that the future of our race lies not with papists but with Protestants. Its leading nations this day are not papal Italy, Spain, and Portugal, but Protestant Germany, England, and America. Well, if we look at those Protestant nations today, how are things going? Are they going very well? Read your newspapers and ask yourselves what has happened. He continues to say that Romanism is apostate Latin Christianity and not general Christianity. It is very specific. He says the Reformation was a return to primitive or non-apostate Christianity. One feature of this great movement was the abandonment of the issue of Latin in public worship and the translation of the scriptures into living languages. So that all nations might read the word of God in their own tongue and understand for themselves its sacred messages. And with this reformation, the names of, and then he rattles them off, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Tyndall, all of these peoples, Cranmer, Hooper, and uh, some of them martyrs, some of them died for this very reason. So here was a scripture-based movement and it was being held back by the fact that the word was not available. It had been lost in the sands of time. It was based on Latin scriptures and nobody understood the dead language. And when truth was revived, almost like in the days of Israel when Ezra found the scribes and he said, here is the word, they've been lost, these words. Here they are again. So it happened here in history. And it was as if all the powers of hell were let loose. Poor old Tyndall, who wrote that Bible in English so meticulously. Poor old Tyndall. He was strangled alive and tied to a stake and burned to death. And poor old Wycliffe, before him, he'd written it. And they dug up his bones many years later and burnt them as well for giving the Bible in a known tongue. Now if we jump for a moment into the present time and we come to our present time in 2007, we had the news that the Pope revives the Latin Mass. And if we read at the bottom here, it is a decision in the last two lines, the motto proprio, which means... He made it of his own accord. You can go back to the Latin Mass. It's like we're taking a step back. Protestantism at its birth and in the 16th century was far more than a mere negation of popery. It was the bursting into the life of the latent truths of Scripture that rent the papacy by reason of the explosive power of life itself. And the question is, did it change anything in the doctrinal positions of the Church of Rome? This is a question we have to ask ourselves. Did it change anything? The man who thinks he can be a Protestant and yet reject the Bible, this is written 120 years ago, reject the Bible or some portion of it making, is making a profound mistake. True Protestantism cannot be anti-Catholic. It also must be anti-modernist, anti-evolutionist, and against every evil that is sapping the life of the Christian churches of today. At the same time, it must be in favor of every good thing, prayer, Bible study, all that is meant by Christian service. That is the Protestantism that is so sorely needed. Now, if we look at the world churches today, isn't one after the other accepting all the modern theisms? Isn't evolutionism a dogma of the churches today? Isn't it synod, a synod decision in most churches today which supports evolution rather than what Genesis says? Isn't that so? And so you can go down the line and it seems as if things have radically changed and if this definition is true, well, then there are very few Protestants around. Luther never felt strong, says 
Grata and Guinness, and free to war against the papal apostasy till he recognized the Pope as Antichrist. Now that's ludicrous. That's ludicrous. Today, nobody believes that. That's ridiculous. The churches today, well, I would go as far as to say 96%, maybe 97% of the Christian world today is dispensationalist. That's the bulk of Christianity. That includes just about everyone. That includes the entire evangelical world. They're dispensationalists. That includes the Pentecostal world. That it, they are dispensationalists. That includes the Baptist world. They are dispensationalists. Were they dispensationalists at their inception? The answer is no. Then what has happened? Either these reformers were all wrong. Phew, that would be a relief. And they died in vain. All the reformers were right. And then we have a problem. Because 96 to 97% of the Christian world today no longer believes what the reformers taught on this issue. They believe in futurism, which is dispensationalism. The Antichrist will come in the future. He will come from the tribe of Dan or something similar. And he will come after the rapture of the Christian church. They will be gone. So it doesn't even affect them. It has something to do with the Jews. Nothing to do with Christianity. And the generations that have gone by, including the whole of the Reformation generation, was barking up the wrong tree. You see, the Antichrist is future. He's still coming. Now, a couple of years ago, some of the mainline churches might still have believed preterism, that the Antichrist was a Greek king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was active in desecrating the temple in Jewish times, in Greek times, and therefore he was in the past. So the Antichrist was put into the past by some and then thrown into the future by others. And today, as the mainline churches saw, well, our churches are getting emptier and emptier and emptier, they all jumped onto the bandwagon of dispensationalism. That is the vogue of the day. So this is no longer modern theology. It was then that he burnt the papal bull when he realized this. Knox's first sermon, the sermon which launched him on his mission as a reformer, was on the prophecies concerning the papacy. The reformers embodied their interpretations of prophecy in their confessions of faith. Calvin in his institutes, all the reformers were unanimous in the matter. Even the mild and cautious Melanchthon, the friend of Martin Luther. You know, Martin Luther was like my wife. We all need good breaks in our life. And she's my breaks. They're worn out already, my poor wife. But Melanchthon was like that. A meek and mild one, and Luther was the tempestuous one. And even he was assured of these prophecies. And if we look at modern theology, well, then they were all wrong. Every single one of them. Now, how much emphasis did they place on prophecy? Were they perhaps just guessing? Did they have a feeling because of the excesses of the papacy in the Middle Ages? So was it just discontent that drove them in this direction? Or was there something more serious? And we have to ask ourselves that question. Did these people die in vain? Did they not die in vain? These are important questions. Martin Luther said, look at the book of Daniel. You know, Martin Luther looked at the book of Revelation. He couldn't make head or tail of it. He says, this can't be right. This can't be in the Bible. And so people often quote him as saying, he discarded the book of Revelation. No, 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 no. Martin Luther translated the New Testament, and then he started with the Old Testament, and he was so excited by the book of Daniel that he took it as number one. 
he translated it first so that the people could read it. He said, this is the book that everybody must have. Everybody must read Daniel. And when he studied Daniel, and when the theologians of his day studied Daniel, suddenly the book of Revelation opened. And instead of being a closed book, it became an open book. And Martin Luther was so excited later by the book of Revelation that when they published his first New Testament, it was covered in pictures taking the scenes from the book of Revelation. Listen to what he writes. Therefore we bid that all earnest Christians read the book of Daniel, to whom it will be a consolation and a great profit in these last miserable times, 400 years ago. He would have to live today to see what's going on. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is at hand. For the same reason we find in Daniel that all the dreams and visions, how fearful they might be, end always in joy and gladness with the coming of Christ and his kingdom. Yea, for that chief article of faith, the coming of Christ, these visions were given, explained, and recorded. Martin Luther played a tremendous role in the Reformation, and he placed a tremendous emphasis on prophecy and on the second coming of Christ. Those were the issues which kept them firing away. Martin Luther wrote Schriften, volume 22, he wrote in 1538, in commenting on the prevalent godlessness, he said, I hope that that day is not far off and we shall still see it. He had a second coming expectation. I hope the last day will not tarry over 100 years, 400 years later, because God's word will be taken away again and a great darkness will come for the scarcity of ministers of the word. We have more ministers today than in any other time in history and I would like to be so bold tonight as to say his words have been fulfilled. That's quite a statement if you take all the preaching that is being done in the world. He wrote, O Christ my Lord, look down upon us and bring upon us thy day of judgment and destroy the brood of Satan in Rome. You could go to jail for saying that today. It would be classified as hate speech. But fortunately I'm just reading history. There sits the man of whom the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians that he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, that man of sin, that son of perdition. What else is papal power but sin and corruption? It leads souls to destruction under thine own name, O Lord. I hope that day of judgment is soon to dawn. Things can and will not become worse than they are at this time. The papal see is practicing iniquity to its heights. It suppresses the law of God and exalts his commandments above the commandments of God. Wow! That's a fascinating statement. Archaic, old-fashioned, out of tune. We have to ask ourselves these questions. They're serious questions. Let's jump to modern times. Let's jump to the American pastor. I'm not here to knock anyone. I'm just showing how times have changed. This is none other than Rick Warren writing in Purpose Driven Life, page 285. And I took a photo stat so that people could read it for themselves. It says there, when the disciples, in the second paragraph there, wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I've given you. Focus on that. Because no one knows the day or the hour. So don't worry about all this prophecy. If you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. Purpose Driven Life, page 286. Martin Luther said, study the prophecies. The modern theologians say, we need a different form of Christianity today. We are not so hooked up on prophecy. That's quite interesting. If you take that the whole world is so hooked on prophecy, but they're hooked on a different kind of prophecy. They're hooked on futurism, some of them perhaps on preterism, 
but nobody's hooked on this kind of prophecy. What does the Bible say about prophecy? 2 Peter 1 verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The Bible says, study your prophecy. For prophecy came not in old time, but by the will of by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1.21 So the Bible says, study the prophecies. Martin Luther said, study the prophecies. Look in the book of Daniel. Martin Luther, 1483-1546. Wow, time flies. 400 years ago. He proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of Paul, Peter, Jude, that the reign of the Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. He must have been wrong. He must have been wrong if 96% of Christianity today says there's no such thing in the Bible. He must have been wrong. He must have been misreading Daniel in the Revelation, he must have been misreading. He must have been misreading what these people were saying. And all the people said, Amen. A holy terror seized souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated in the pontifical throne. This new idea which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. This is history. This is what happened historically. This is where we're heading. This is taken from the very first printing of Martin Luther's book, the Bible, which is God's book, not even his book. And what is this? This is a depiction of the woman standing on the moon with the 12 stars and the dragon spewing out water to overcome the woman. This is straight from the book of Revelation. Here he is, and he's showing the beast with the seven heads, with the woman riding upon it, with the triple crown, which is the papal triple crown, the woman, the church, riding on this beast, this political entity, and the kings of the world bowing down in reverent obedience. Taken straight from the book of Revelation and applying the prophecy to the papacy. This is his first printing. This is the first great Bible. Here's another illustration from Martin Luther's Bible. On the left over there we have Jesus driving the money exchanges out of the temple. And on the right you have his representative inviting the money exchangers into the temple. By contrast. And then he has that little dog at the bottom. Fascinating illustrations. Because the Bible says, outside are the dogs. And dogs means unbelievers. But here we have the dogs inside. Fascinating what these reformers came up with. A great cloud of witnesses joined them. Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer, the, the seventh century Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, the men who published the Westminster Confession, the Baptist Confession of Faith. Sir Isaac Newton joined them, the greatest scientist who ever lived. He wrote more about the Bible than he wrote about science. Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, Bishop Ryle, all of these great reformers, they all said exactly the same thing. And today, they are condemned as being in error. All right, so what did Martin Luther and all these reformers see in the books of Daniel and in the Revelation? Was there something which the modern theologians perhaps are missing? In Daniel chapter 7, you have a prophecy about the little horn power. And the reformers were all unanimous in saying that this little horn power pointed to the papacy. Now, was it conjecture or was it based on the Bible? And these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And he shall be diverse from the first. The other horns referred to in the Bible all referred to secular powers, but this one was going to be different. And here are the attributes. I'm just going to run through them quickly for you. 
It arises out of the fourth beast. And the fourth beast they identified as Rome. So they said it was a Roman power. It arises among the ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Verse 8, Daniel chapter 7. So they were saying, well, the fourth beast is Rome, and there are ten horns, ten kingdoms. The Roman Empire had been divided up into ten by the barbarians. And after it, there came this little horn. After the ten horns, another shall arise after them. Verse 24. So after the division of the Roman Empire, there would arise this little horn. And this one was to be different from the other horns. He will be diverse from the first. Verse 24. These are the characteristics which the reformers used to identify the Antichrist. He's more stout than the others. And that we find in verse 20. So he has political clout. He can set up kings. He can depose kings. He has the power to do that. He can divide territories. Which power did that? They attributed it to the papal power. He uprooted three kingdoms before whom three fell. Well, it's history that the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and the Vandals were opposed to the system's rise and that they were eradicated in order to give horn status, and horn in the Bible by definition is political status, uh, to the system. And then he had eyes like the eyes of a man, and he spoke great words against the Most High. We find that in verse 8 and verse 25. In this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things against the Most High. Verse 25, I'll show you what the reformers did with that one. It's quite interesting. And he will wear out the saints. This power will make war against God's people. Now it's fascinating that preterism and futurism leave out the entire spectrum of Christianity. He will change times and laws. He will think to change times and laws. Verse 25. Which power would have the cheek to attack God's law? What other attributes does it have? It would rule for a time, times, and half a time. They shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and the dividing of time. Verse 25. Today, we make that a literal three and a half years and apply it to the Antichrist power, which will come sometime after the rapture. The reformers had a totally different view on that, as we will see. It shall devour the whole earth. This is interesting. The fourth beast which shall be different shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it and it will exist until the end, until the ancient of days came. So it arises out of the fourth beast, out of the, Greek, uh, the Roman Empire. It reigns until when? Until the coming of Christ. But here we have a problem because modern theology says something else. He's going to come in the future. And then his dominion will be taken away at the end of time. The judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Now the reformers were so adamant about this prophecy that they decided to put it in stone. And so in their main seat of Protestantism, which was Nuremberg in Germany, they decided to get the best sculptor of his day to put it in stone above the Rathaus. And there it is in Nuremberg to this day standing there as a silent witness. Now let me just give you the citation here. It says the Rathaus or the town hall with three magnificent Doric portals over which the prophetic beasts of Daniel are carved. These impressive figures authorized by the city council were sculpted by the well-known artist Leonard Kern when? 1617. That's almost 400 years ago. And there they've stood silent witnesses to the theology of the reformers. Under the building of vaulted dungeons and chambers of torture early employed by the Holy Office, of the Inquisition, that is, for the prosecution of dissenters and confessors of the Reformed faith. 
So here they turned the tables, and where there were dungeons of torture, here they put their theology in stone. Now let's have a look at these. And the idea came to me, I wonder how many people today, 400 years later, would even know what it stands for. And uh, it puzzled me and tickled me, and so we got a couple of friends together, and we went there to find out. Well, here they are, all these magnificent portals of the Reformation. And here's the one portal depicting the first two beasts of Daniel chapter 7. And if you look on the left there, you can see a figure and a lion with eagle's wings. And on the right, there's a bear with three ribs in his mouth. And if you go to the other side, well, there you will see another figure on the left a leopard beast with four heads, and you have another figure next to it. And on the right over there, you have the terrible beast with the ten horns and another figure next to it. And they wanted to make sure we don't forget. So they put, next to the one on the left there, next to the leopard beast, they put Alexander the Great, so that posterity wouldn't forget they said, that's Greece. And next to the next one, they put Julius Caesar, just to make sure that people don't forget we're dealing with Rome. So let's have a look at them. There's the lion with eagle wings, the first beast. Next to him, none other than Nebuchadnezzar. Who did they say it was? Babylon. Babylon. They said it represented Babylon. On the other side, they put Cyrus the Great. The second beast, they said, was Medo-Persia. And then on the other portal, the four-headed leopard beast of Daniel chapter 7, they put right there, Alexander the Great. And on the other side, they put Julius Caesar and the terrible beast with the ten horns, amongst which came up another little horn. So the little horn was definitely Roman. It wasn't Greek. Now that's a problem. Because if preterism is right... And then the little horn must be Greek and he must come out of the third beast and not out of the fourth beast. If futurism is right, well then we have even a bigger problem because then all the beasts are gone and there is no fourth beast, and then it must <laughs> come out of nothing. So here we have a problem. We have a theological problem. Daniel 7 verse 8, I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things and there they've depicted it and note how cute they were, they put the little face on that horn, did you see that? They were very cute these reformers, they didn't want us to forget so I wondered whether people had perhaps forgotten. And by the way, this theology must be wrong because 96% of Christianity, maybe 97, 98% doesn't believe it. It must be wrong. So this interpretation is a problem. So let's go and ask the people, what's happening over here? Can anybody please tell us? So we stopped the people of Nuremberg and we asked them some questions. Excuse me, young girls, young men, old men, teachers, tour guides, Rathaus tour guides, could you tell us what this uh, means? Have you any idea as to what is going on, as to what is happening over there? Ooh, what's that? It's weird. These old folks really were weird when they put all those things up there. And they're laughing. We had amazing stories come out. What does this represent? Who are these ten horns? What's that little horn coming up amongst them? Well, here is the Rathaus. And uh, let's have a look at this interview. Underneath is written... What these people are saying, obviously most of them are German. There's just one that could speak English. One was Spanish, we didn't include them, and many, many we didn't include. We asked hordes of people. By the way, how many could tell us what it was? 
Not one. Not one. Let's have a look. Yes. Do you know, do you have an idea what does it mean, these two sculptures? Oh. I don't know what it means. I don't, don't know, know what it means. It. Darf? Markus Lukas, Johannes Matthäus. Ja, ja, die Bibel nicht gelesen, ich bin Protestant. Ja, das sind die vier. Sie sind Protestant ja, und ja. haben die Bibel nicht gelesen? Nein, ich... Ach ja, du? Interessant. Ja, ich habe es gelesen, wie liest man nicht, wie kennt man. Ich habe die Bibel gesehen. Die Bibel liest man nicht, die Bibel kennt man. Das ist ja kein Buch, was man liest und am Ende weiß man, wie es ausgeht. Ja? <lacht> ah ja. Mhm. <lacht> Wissen Sie vielleicht die Bedeutung dieser Skulpturen, wenn Sie sich das anschauen? Oh, nein. Haben Sie, eine Idee? Haben Sie eine Idee? Wissen Sie nicht, was das sein könnte? Ja. Was das darstellt? Na, könnte man ja. gar nicht vorstellen. Ja. Was könnte denn das bedeuten? Die Kinder dürfen auch was sagen. Diese Figuren da oben und die Tiere im Hintergrund. Was könnte das für eine Bedeutung haben? Habt ihr in der Schule da schon mal was drüber gehört? Eigentlich doch. Doch gar nichts drüber gehört? Nee. Im Geschichtsunterricht, im Religionsunterricht? Gar nichts gehört? Eigentlich nichts gehört? Mhm. Weißt du es, Papa? Ich weiß es grundsätzlich auch nicht. Sind Sie denn Nürnberger? Oder aus äh, ich, bin eigentlich, äh, ja, ich bin eigentlich Nürnberger. Ich wohne zwar mittlerweile in Fürth, aber ja. ich ja. bin schon immer. Ja. bin seit 1949 in Nürnberg. In Nürnberg. Was könnten denn die Skulpturen, die Figuren bedeuten hier am Rathaus von Nürnberg? Da muss ich Ihnen ganz ehrlich sagen, habe ich mir. So, äh, das äh, noch keine Gedanken darüber gemacht, ich muss sagen, ich habe eigentlich noch nie hingeguckt. Ja. Aber irgendwie macht es mir den Eindruck, als ob das irgendwas Maritimes äh, Maritim? Ja. Neptun. Neptun? Neptun. Also ich ja. bin jetzt wirklich überfragt, ja, muss ja. ich ganz ehrlich sagen. Ja, ja. Es gab nie eine Aufklärung in der Volkshochschule zu Nürnberg oder nee, in den Schulen nicht, über das Rathaus wurde und seine, nee, ja, nee, wurde nicht sagen, gesprochen. Über, über ja. nicht. Also man, das, ist, das ist ein Lehrer aus Nürnberg. Das ist ein Lehrer, ist ein Lehrer. Sie sind Lehrer aus ja. Nürnberg. Ein Lehrer. <lacht> also Sie haben keine Idee, meine Herren, in der Schule was darüber gehört, bei der Stadtführung, Wolfscher Bau, jawohl. Ja, erbaut. Ich habe bestimmt mal was zurückgehört. Eine Idee? Eine Idee. Wenn es ein gutes Ding ist, müsste es doch dort stehen irgendwo. Ne? Ja. 1600 selbiges Mal? Im 16. Jahrhundert, sagen wir mal so. Oh, dann ist es ja. falsch. Ja. Dann ist es 1500 selbiges ja. Mal. Und was können wir Hat irgendeine Figuren? Verbindung mit Venedig zu tun? Machen Sie mal weiter. Also, zwei Figuren, Wegen zwei Hals. Tiere im Hintergrund. Ist es der venezianische Löwe irgendwo dabei? Wenn könnte, Sie sind Lehrer. Welches Fach belegen Sie denn? Ich bin Geschichte Hauptschullehrer. Hauptschullehrer? Ja. Dann wird es in der Stadtführung, in Exkursionen hier aufgeklärt, was diese Bedeutungen sind? Am, am Wolfsonathaus wird das gemacht? Also ich habe es in der Uni damals gemacht, das ist schon ja. über 20 Jahre ja. her. Ne? Ja. Also von daher ja. weiß ich jetzt nicht so genau, ob das, ob das vorgekommen ja. ist. Ja. Da fragen Sie mich natürlich. Das ist der Tourguide. Ja. Da muss ich leider passen. Ja. Noch nie was darüber gehört nee. in den Exkursionen? Nee, mit, mit Sicherheit mal. Ja. Allerdings ja. geht es natürlich dann auch immer schnell wieder verloren. Ja, verstehe. Ne? Aber so in den Stadtführungen zu Nürnberg wird es nicht erwähnt, was die Bedeutung dieser Figuren am Rathaus ist. Zumindest jetzt nicht bei denen, ja. äh, die mir im Gedächtnis geblieben sind. Ja, ja. Und Sie sind konkret für die Lochgefängnisse Richtig. zuständig. Allerdings ja. nur als Absolut. Ja, Absolut. Ja, ja, ja. Schauen Sie mal, sind Sie aus Nürnberg? Ja. Schauen Sie mal hier auf unser Rathaus. Diese Figuren, welche Bedeutung haben diese Figuren? Ja, nicht alle, sondern das ist zum Teil der Reichsadler. Der Reichsadler? Das äh, ist äh, das andere Wappen, aber nicht das Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg. Ja, es ist nicht das ja. Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg. Aha. Und die Tiere und die Men also diese Figuren oben, ich welche Bedeutung? Ich so wissen Sie nicht, Sie wissen Sie nicht. Ich danke Ihnen sehr herzlich. Isn't that incredible? Not even the tour guide. And we knocked and we knocked and we knocked and said, please, we need the tour guide. The tour guide came out, as you saw. Has anybody ever explained this to you as tour guide? No. Nope. Uh, you are responsible for the dungeons down there? Yep. Do you know what it means? No. Nope. The other man said, Neptune, perhaps it's Neptune. It's amazing. Nobody remembers. And that's why... I'm doing these lectures. I think it's time we remember. 
There are three. I'm going to read to you what the Reformers are writing. And I'm going to tell you what the Reformation stood for. And if it is logical, and if it's Bible-based, and if it's accurate, well, then there's something seriously wrong with the times in which we are living. There are three distinct sets of prophecies. This is written 120 years ago. Of the rise, character, deeds, and doom of Romanism. And this man belonged to the great church of England. The first is found in the book of Daniel, the second in the epistle of Paul, and the third in the letters of the apocalypse of John. And no one of these three is complete in itself. It is only by combining their separate features that we obtain the perfect portrait. Daniel's foreview presents the political character and relations of Romanism. The Apostle Paul's foreview, on the other hand, gives the ecclesiastical character and relations of the power. And John's prophecies, both in Revelation 13 and 17, present the combination of both. The mutual relations of the Latin church and the Roman state. So there are three distinct sets of prophecies. And there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Daniel 7 verse 8. Let's read what the reformers wrote. This is a summary of the Reformation theology. The rule of Rome, we repeat, has never ceased. It was a secular pagan power for five or six centuries. It has been an ecclesiastical and apostate Christian power ever since. The rule of Rome revived in a new form and was as real under the popes as of, the, uh, of the 13th century as it had been under the Caesars of the first. It was as oppressive, cruel, and bloody under Innocent III as it had been under Nero and Domitian. The reality was the same, though the forms had changed. The Caesars did not persecute the witnesses of Jesus more severely and bitterly than did the popes. Diocletian did not destroy the saints who opposed the gospel more than did the Inquisition in the papal days. Rome is one and the same all through, both locally and morally. So they're saying it's the same system. The Pope even has the same title as the Caesars. You can look at the statues of the Caesars, you will find the letters PM Pontifex Maximus. You look at the statues of the Popes, you find the same letters PM Pontifex Maximus. The power symbolized by the proud, intelligent, blasphemous, head-like little horn of the Roman beast, to this he devotes, on the contrary, the greater part of the prophecy. And I must ask you now, and I think we should do the same today, let's follow the reformers and see what they say. I must ask you now carefully to note the various points that prove that this horn to be a marvelous prophetic symbol or hieroglyph of the Roman papacy, fitting as one of Chubb's keys, fits the lock for which it was made perfectly in every part, while it refuses absolutely to adapt itself to any other. Excuse me, what's wrong with this man? 96% of the Christian world says he's wrong. And there must be another solution. These reformers had it wrong. Now, what did you exactly say? He says, it's place. Within the body of the fourth empire, biblical or not, comes up in the fourth beast. It doesn't come up in the, in the other beasts. And by the way, you can't be wrong with the beasts because the Bible says itself who these beasts are. You cannot go wrong. The period of its origin, soon after the division of the Roman territory into ten kingdoms. It arises after these horns. It's nature. Different from the other kingdoms, though in some respect like them. It was a horn, but with eyes and a mouth. It would be a kingdom like the rest, a monarchy, but its king would be overseers, eyes, or bishops and prophets. Its moral character, boastful, blasphemous, great words spoken against the Most High. Its lawlessness, it would claim authority over times and laws. We'll get to that, we'll see what they said about it. Its opposition to the saints, it would be a persecuting power and that for so long a period that it would wear out the saints of the Most High who would be given into his hand for a time. Its duration, time, times and half, or 1,260 years. Not three and a half years. 1,260 years. This was the Reformation position. It would suffer the loss, its doom, it would suffer the loss of its dominions before it was itself destroyed. They will take away its dominion to consume and destroy it to the end. They do all meet in the Roman papacy, Latin language of the Caesar is the only church that is or ever has been named from a city. 
The papacy fulfills the first condition thereof. During that time, the ten kingdoms were forming. The little horn grew up amongst the ten. The papacy developed synchronously with the Gothic kingdoms. So they were basing it on prophecy. Then he says, let's look at Paul's description. Paul's foreview consists of two parts. The first gives a general view of a great apostasy. The second, a carefully drawn portrait of the power in which the apostasy would be headed up. And then he quotes, Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Futurism. Has that anything to do with Christianity? No. Because it arises after the rapture of the Christian church. But Paul says, out of you, out of you Christians, will come this power. So he's saying, of your own selves shall men arise. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, and I quotes Paul, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And then he continues and he says, here we have not only a prediction that there would be an apostasy or a falling away from the faith in the Christian church, but a description of its origin and character. His origin was to be satanic. Its doctrines were to be doctrines of devils or demons. It was to assume authority, to lay down laws and prohibitions. Prominent amongst these was the prohibition of marriage. Marriage, although thus divinely ordained, would be prohibited. And meats, though created to be received with thanksgiving, would be forbidden, certain foods. The substitution of an external religiousness and self-imposed sacrifice and true holiness of heart, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared as with a hot iron. Do they meet in the papacy? Which church forbids its ecclesia to marry? The papacy. Do they have special injunctions in terms of eating and drinking? Yes, they have special fast periods, they have Lent fast periods, and the Ecclesia is subject to specific fasts, as we will see to this very day in the monasteries, etc. So here is another form of religion. This features of false profession reappears in the corresponding prophecy in 2 Timothy concerning the last days, in which the abettors and adherents of the apostasies are described as men having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These men were not then to be open opponents of godliness, but on the contrary, they would be great professors. But the Antichrist power of futurism is an opposer and not a confessor. But 96% of Christianity believes this and not what these reformers believe. And then he quotes the man of sin versus the man of God. The man of sin, like the man of God, has a broad extended meaning. When we read that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, we do not suppose it means any one individual. Although it has the definite article, it indicates a whole class of men of a certain character, succession, or similar individuals. A man of sin could be only one, just as the king of England could mean only an individual. The king, on the other hand, may include a whole dynasty. When in speaking of the Jewish tabernacle in the Hebrews, Paul says that into the holiest of all went the high priest alone every year. He includes the entire succession of high priests of Israel. That a singular expression in a prophecy may find its fulfillment in the plurality of individuals is perfectly clear from John's word, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even so now are many Antichrists. You see, a counter-argument was, man of sin is singular, so it can't refer to a system. So the reformers look at the theology and they argue like this. Grammatically, it may mean either an individual or a succession of similar individuals. The context determines that it actually does mean the latter. 
the mystery of iniquity in which the man of sin was latent was already working in Paul's day. So the Pope of Rome may intimate one single bishop or a long succession of perpetual persons. So the man of sin. This was their argument. He says no duration is mentioned in the prophecy by Paul, only two time limits. Daniel has a duration, but Paul has two time limits. And he quotes, Already the apostasy was developing and it would not be destroyed till the advent. Paul's features of Antichrist chronology reveal when it would arise after the fall of Rome and that it would exist to the second coming, compare Daniel, when he would be destroyed. So the two limits said by Paul are identical to the two limits said by Daniel. And the problem is that both preterism and futurism fall outside of the two limits. So who was right? The reformers or the modern theologians? We have to ask ourselves these questions. He sits in the temple of God. I like the argument here. It's logical. You know what? I'm tired of people saying Christianity is a crutch. It's not a crutch, it's a cross. It's tough to be a Christian. He sits in the temple of God. The face of the man of sin is the face of a false apostle, the dark face of a Judas. Written upon the wall of the temple, son of perdition. Did you know that that word occurs only twice, that title in the Bible? One in regard to Judas and one in regard to the Antichrist. Only twice is it used. So he says he sits in the temple, son of perdition. The man of sin is a Judas, a secret enemy while a seeming friend. A familiar friend, yet a fatal foe who betrays with a kiss and a hell master. Observe the place occupied by the man of sin, the temple or house of God. Now notice what the reformers said. Please note it very carefully. They said, this is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. This was the position of the Reformation. What is the position of modern theology? What does futurism dictate? What does dispensationalism dictate today? We are going to see a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, all eyes on Jerusalem. And when that temple is rebuilt, Antichrist will come and he will sit in that temple of stone and he will suppress the Jews. Is that the modern theology? Yes or no? That's the modern theology. It's preached by virtually every mega group on the planet, from Pentecostalism, through evangelicals, through Baptist theology today, all of them are preaching that message. The reformer says, this is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. Why would they say that? They must be wrong. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians and Ephesians with reference to the Christian church. In the second epistle to the Corinthians, writing to Gentile Christians, he says, Ye are the temple of the living God. In Ephesians, he calls the church a holy temple, a habitation of God through the Spirit. To fall emphatically, the temple of God was the church of Christ. This is the temple in which his prophetic eyes saw the man of sin seated. It is no person in a temple of stone, but a power in the Christian church. That was the position of the Reformation. It's biblical, it's logical, it's sound exegesis. His character, as Christ acts for God, so the man of sin acts for Satan. Christ and he are antagonistic powers, the power of light, the power of darkness, the majesty of heaven, the might of hell. And as the Son of God humbled himself, so the man of sin exalts himself. There is infinite self-abasement in a one and the divine nature stooping to humanity and infinite self-exaltation in the other, the human and the satanic assuming to be divine. 
He as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or is divine or divine being. There is no article here before the name of God. The expression indicates that the man of sin would show himself by acts and professions to be possessed of superhuman and divine dignity, authority, and power. They were thorough. They were thorough in their Bible study. I like this argument. This is profound. You know, when I read what these reformers wrote, it struck me how deep their theology was. Observe the position of the man of sin. Notice the word sitteth. And connect it with a seat, a word which occurs three times in the New Testament. It is used twice with reverence to the seat in the temple of those who sold doves, who turned the house of God into a house of merchandise and a den of thieves. And once in the sentence, note carefully, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. It comes from the Greek katitso. And from katitso comes the word cathedral, the bishop's seat. And also the expression ex cathedra, as when we say the Pope speaks ex cathedra or from his seat officially. There in that exalted cathedral position and claiming to represent God, the man of sin was to act and abide as the pretended vicar but real antagonist of Christ, undermining his authority, abolishing his laws, and oppressing his people. Wow! If this exegesis is correct, then we are in serious trouble today. He says, let's compare what Paul wrote and what Daniel wrote. Both are Roman. The self-exalting horn or head represented by Daniel is Roman. And the other one has a geographical seat. The time when he arises, all of it fits. They have the same chronological point of origin. Both arise on the fall of the individual undivided empire of Rome and they have the same chronological termination. It ends when Christ comes. Both exalt themselves against God. Daniel mentions the proud words of the blasphemous little horn. Paul, the audacious deeds of the man of sin showing himself to be divine. Both begin small, inconspicuous powers developed gradually by great influential ones. Both claim to be teachers of men. Please note this one. Daniel's little horn was to have eyes. As a bishop or overseer, the word bishop means overseer, in that he was to have a mouth, that is, he was to be a teacher, while Paul assigns to the man of sin ecclesiastical eminence, a proud position in the temple of God or the Christian church. So here we're talking about a Christian system and not some future system that has nothing to do with Christianity. Both are persecutors. Daniel describes the little horn as a persecutor wearing out the saints. And Paul speaks of the man of sin as opposing and calls him the lawless one. So these are comparisons that cannot just be disregarded. To sum up, the two have the same place, Rome, the same period from the 6th century to the second coming of the Lord in glory, the same wicked character, the same lawlessness, the same self-exultant defiance of God, the same gradual growth from weakness to dominion, the same episcopal pretensions, the same persecuting character, the same twofold doom. Everything fits, slots in. And then he sums it up. He says these resemblances are so important, so numerous, so comprehensive and exact, as to prove beyond all question that the self-exalting, persecuting power predicted by Daniel and this man of sin foretold by Paul are one and the same power. Even Romanists admit this to be the case and call the power thus doubly predicted the Antichrist. The only thing they do is they throw it into the future or they throw it into the past. This is the Douay Bible. This is the Roman Catholic counter-Bible to the Reformation. It says, He sitteth in the temple of God, etc. By these words is described to us the great Antichrist. Come from their own Bible notes. But of course, just throw him into the future so that generations of Christians can just sit and not be perturbed 
by the power of Antichrist. He has nothing to do with them. Now what did the reformers say? Well, let's go to the reformers themselves and see how they argued the point. Nicholas von Amstorf, who was he? He lived from 1483 to 1565, and he was a contemporary of Luther's. He was a theologian in the early Lutheran church, and Luther said of him, my spirit finds rest in my dear Amstorf. So they were soulmates. Van Amstorff writes, He, the Antichrist, will be revealed and come to naught before the last day, so that every man shall comprehend and recognize that the Pope is the real true Antichrist and not the Vicar of Christ. Therefore those who consider the Pope and his bishops as Christian shepherds and bishops are deeply in error. But even more are those who believe that the Turk is the Antichrist. Boom! I want to give you the argument of the Reformers. Today we have voices which are going up all over the world which are saying, Islam is the Antichrist. Right? Have you heard that? Yes. Many churches are beginning to say, Islam, Islam is the problem. Well, the reformers already said that's nonsense. The Turk stands for Islam. Why are they in error? Because the Turk rules outside of the church and does not sit in the holy place, nor does he seek to bear the name of Christ, but is an open antagonist of Christ and his church. This does not need to be revealed. It is clear and evident because he persecutes Christians openly and not as the Pope does secretly under a form of godliness. Pretty sound argument as far as I'm concerned. It sounds perfectly logical. Let's go to another reformer, 1570. This is Flacius, who wrote a tractate on Antichrist, and he says, The sixth and last reason for our separation from the Pope and his followers be this. By many writings of our church, by the divinely inspired word, by prophecies concerning the future, and by the special characteristics of the papacy, it has been profusely and thoroughly proved that the Pope with his prelates and clergy is the real true Antichrist and that his kingdom is the real kingdom, a never-ceasing fountain and the mother of all abominable idolatry. That's the Reformation position. It's harsh, it's straight, it's direct. This is George Nigrinus, 1530 to 1602, an evangelical theologian, and he was uh, also a German. And he used to take up the argument with the Jesuits. So there's a lot of discourse between him and the Jesuits. He says, The Jesuits claim to be sorely offended and have taken my declaration as an insult and a blasphemy in branding the papacy as the Antichrist, of which Daniel, Paul, Peter, John, and even Christ prophesied. And then he says, But this is as true as it is that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow! And I'm prepared to show it even by their own definition of the word antichrist. These reformers, they didn't mince words. They stood up and they said their thing. This Jesuit further contends that the papacy cannot be antichrist because the papacy has lasted for centuries. Please listen to his argument. But that the antichrist is supposed to reign only three and a half years. Who teaches that today? The entire world? The entire world, you hear it from every pulpit. And what did the reformer say? He says, this Jesuit contends that there will be three and a half years. But no one doubts today that Daniel spoke of year days and not literal days. The prophetic time periods of 42 months, 1,260 days, one, two and a half times, are prophetic, and according to Ezekiel 4, a day must be taken for a year. Antiochus, their preterist antichrist, and as many is a, is a type of antichrist, and as many days as he raged and raved against the Jews, so many years shall spiritual Antiochus, antichrist, rage in the midst of the Christian church. Fascinating stuff. So they took it for day years. By the way, does the papacy fulfill this condition? When did it arise as a horn 
A horn has to have political status, not just church status. It got its political status in 538 AD under the protection of Belisarius, the Pope sat on his throne and took the titles of the Caesars of Rome and ruled a specific territory, the Papal States. He was a king. 538, he got that power. When the last of the three horns, the Ostrogoths, was destroyed and power was handed to him. And when did he lose political power? 1798, Napoleon captured the Pope, abolished the papal political power, took away the political states, handed them over to Italy, and the political power of the papacy ended in 1798. Precisely 1,260 years. Revelation says that the wound would be healed. And the whole world would wander after the beast. That means the horn must rise again. Did he get his political power back? Yes. When? 1929. Mussolini gave him back a portion of the states, the Vatican, which is an independent, sovereign political power. So he fulfills the prophecy precisely, and the reformers identified it as such. Now, let's look at another reformer, David Kreiterus, 1530. That's the last of the fathers of the Lutheran Church. The Lord himself revealed to Daniel how long the four world kingdoms should exist and how long the little horn should last. This little horn is also described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians, which we are told this is the Antichrist power. The papacy would be fully revealed just before the judgment should take place. We know today that the four monarchies have long passed off the stage of action that the two-horned beast, which is mentioned in Revelation 13 and which refers to the same powers, cannot last much longer. And so he describes this picture and he says, here we have the story. What did Calvin say? The Presbyterian church today call themselves Calvinists. Calvin said, some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist, but those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show, and then he continues to show Paul's words and says exactly what the reformers said. John Knox, he said the papacy was the Antichrist. He said the tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church. As with Luther, he concluded that he is the very Antichrist. Imagine this. John Knox comes to Scotland, Catholic country, and he preaches Daniel chapter 7. That's his first sermon. Can you believe that? And the whole of Scotland becomes Protestant. Unbelievable. When last have you heard a sermon on Daniel chapter 7? Is my question today. Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be the very Antichrist himself, I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers and strong reasons referring to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Roger Williams, please note who this man is. 1603 to 1683, first Baptist pastor in America. This is what the Baptist church believed. This was a Baptist minister. What magnificent truth is preached Pastor Williams spoke of the Pope as the pretended vicar of Christ on earth who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of his vassals, yea, over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself, speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. So here we have all these great preachers. This is the Baptist Confession. It states... The Pope of Rome is that man of sin and the son of petition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
Excuse me, is this being preached today from those pulpits? No. This is antiquated, archaic theology. The Westminster Confession. There is no head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but he is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. That's the Westminster Confession of Protestantism. John Wesley. He is an emphatic sense, the man of sin. He, is incre he increases all manner of sin above measure and he is too properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. He it is that exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. This is the Reformation position. I would like you to take careful note of what one of the greatest preachers of all time preached. This is Charles Spurgeon. You know, I stand shocked when I hear this man talk. He says, it is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. Wow. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. Well, isn't it surprising that so many sane men today raise the question? Well, what are you saying to us, Spurgeon? No sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. He says it's either the Pope or nothing. Another Protestant says, if the Pope in Rome is not Antichrist, then he has bad luck to be so exactly like him. <laughs> and he says, if there were to be issued a hue and a cry for Antichrist, we would certainly take up this church on suspicion, and it would certainly not be let loose again, for it so exactly answers the description. Has it been let loose again? Absolutely. Popery is contrary to Christ's gospel. And is the Antichrist then we ought to pray against it? It should be the daily prayer of every believer that Antichrist might be hurled like a millstone into the flood and for Christ because it wounds Christ, because it robs Christ of his glory, because it puts sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement and lifts a piece of bread in the place of the Savior and a few drops of water in the place of the Holy Ghost and puts a mere fallible man like ourselves up as the vicar of Christ on earth. And then he softens it, and I like this, and we should all do this. If we pray against it because it is against him, we shall love the persons though we hate their errors. We shall love their souls though we loathe and detest their dogmas. And so the breath of our prayers will be sweetened because we turn our faces towards Christ when we pray. Beautiful. I'd like to confess I was Roman Catholic. And when I heard these things for the first time, I was sick to my stomach and I became physically ill as a consequence of this message. And I called the Roman Catholic priest who I knew well and I said, come to my house, I need to talk to you. Please explain this to me here in the scripture what it says. And he said to me, I'm not into scripture. It's like that young man who said, I'm a Protestant, but I've never read the Bible. Did you hear him say that? Did you see that? And the other man said, the Bible one has, but one doesn't read it. Because you cannot tell the end from the beginning. We're living in terrible times. I had the Methodist pastor come to my house. I said to him, please explain to me why you've shifted the Antichrist to preterism. He was a preterist. He believed it was Antiochus. I said, please explain it to me here from the Bible. And he said, well, there it is. I said, no, excuse me, that's the third beast. The Bible says he comes out of the fourth beast. He took his elder by the ears. He closed his ears and he walked him out of my house. And I was asking questions. Why? Because I was in turmoil. My entire family is Catholic. Can you imagine what that does? All your beautiful family, your cousins, your friends. These people ate with me. They drank with me. These are my friends. 
And I had to make a decision. I had to preach this message. So if we ask ourselves what's happening here at the right house, let's just sum it up. Town hall of Nuremberg. Here the reformers hewed in stone what they believed the figures of Daniel chapter 7 depicted so that posterity should never forget. On the left up there we have the lion with eagle wings, representation of Babylon, and this they confirmed by putting Nebuchadnezzar next to the lion. On the other side over here we have the bear, the second beast of Daniel chapter 7 with three ribs in its mouth, which they identified as the Medo-Persian Empire, and they put Cyrus the Great next to it so that nobody should forget. Above this doorway we have the other two beasts of Daniel chapter 7. On the left there we have the leopard beast with the four heads and the four heads were depicted as Greece as we see by the statue of Alexander the Great which they have placed next to the four-headed leopard beast. On the other side we have the terrible beast of Daniel chapter 7 with the ten horns and the little horn which has a face on it in the center. The reformers were all united on the fact that the little horn represented the papal system. In fact, John Knox preached his first sermon on the beasts of Daniel 7, and this started the Reformation in Scotland. It was only when the reformers realized that these beasts represented a sweep through history and that the little horn was the final phase of the Antichrist power that they separated from Rome and regarded the papal system as the Antichrist system. They hewed it here in stone that posterity should never forget, but they have surely forgotten, as we saw here today, with all the amazing answers that we got to the question, what do these animals represent? Well, I want to take you to modern Germany. I walked on the footsteps with my friends of the Reformation. And this is probably one of the great centers of the Reformation. You cannot get a bigger center than this. I mean, after all, there it says it is a UNESCO center, a World Heritage Site. This is the Wartburg. This is the greatest historical event in history after the Middle Ages. This is where Martin Luther translated the Bible and gave us the New Testament in a tongue that everyone could understand. Well, we went to the Wartburg. Wartburg, what can you reveal to us? It's beautifully restored. It's magnificently adorned. Communist East Germany supplied the funds for its restoration. It's a magnificent building today. This is the old drawbridge that had been drawn up and Martin Luther was inside and the papal assassins were outside waiting for him to stick his nose out. If he should have done it, he would have been dead. So he decided to work, which is good for him. And there's the old drawbridge. And inside you have this magnificent restoration. It must have cost countless millions to restore this place. And we dutifully went and we stood in the queue and we joined the tour through the Wartburg. And we were going to go through the history of the Wartburg and we were going to find out what it all meant and where all these great events took place. We were excited. And the tour guide, he was a young fellow, well trained, very articulate, took us from room to room. Here is the old hall where they sat in the Wartburg, where the, uh, the Duke sat. And if you look at the windows, today, restored, you have St. Francis, and there you have St. Elizabeth. In German, that would be Die Heilige Elisabeth, St. Elizabeth. She was a German saint, much like a, a Mother Teresa, who has been canonized. And here you have the Wartburg concert, and it says there, Elisabeth von Thüringen, 1207 to 1231, it says down there. She was the great patron saint 
of this area. And the tour guide took us from one building, from one room to the next, beautiful mosaics against the wall like this. And in every hall, for more than an hour, we heard about the great deeds of Saint Elizabeth, die heilige Elisabeth. There were Catholic crosses, there were candles, there were great mosaics. And I'll give you a sweep, and you can just hear in the background the tour guide speaking. It's not very good, but you can hear him talking about Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Eventually, we heard so much about the Holy Elizabeth that we were starting to get anxious. The tour is an hour, and the hour was almost up, one room after the other. We were walking on the footsteps of the Reformation, and this is the greatest heritage site that the Reformation has to offer. Tour guide was showing us these mosaics with one depiction of the Holy Elizabeth after the other. Magnificent. Well, when you come into the portal, this is what you see. Elisabeth von Thüringen. And there is the, the poor sinner kneeling at the feet of Elizabeth. You see, Roman Catholic theology says that if someone is a saint, he has additional merit. He has done more than it requires to go to heaven. And therefore, this additional merit can be transferred to someone who has a shortcoming in that area. And that is why the veneration of saints is encouraged. Martin Luther is depicted in the same portal as the great beer drinker, the drunkard. Eine Frage noch, Herr Luther. A question, Mr. Luther. And then they have this picture of Martin Luther down there. Hier spreche ich und kann ich anders. Martin Luther, the great graffiti man. Hier spreche ich und kann ich anders. A reference to, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. And here it's being ridiculed. Der Ring der Elisabeth. Oh, if you can touch the ring of the Holy Elizabeth, you will be saved. Elisabeth von Thüringen, Heilige Elisabeth. Hundreds of books on all of these things. As we were walking through this great arena, wondering when are we going to get to the Reformation and the time's going, I started grumbling. And some of us started to grumble. And a man... Fairly big man, not enormous, but fairly big, but very impressive in his appearance. Leather boots, leather pants, leather jacket. He had biked to the area, and he looked tough. And he walked up to me, and he looked a bit grumpy, and he went, mm. and he bumped me in my ribs. And I said, ooh, I better keep quiet. Maybe I'm disturbing the man. And then eventually we got to the next Holy Elizabeth exhibit, and this man popped. And he said, I came to this place, and I walked to the Lutherstube, and I wanted to go in there where he translated the Bible. And what did they do? They didn't let me in. They threw me out. I was denied access. So, I joined the tour, and now... What's happening? Nothing about Luther, only this Heilige Elisabeth, Heilige Elisabeth. I'm a Lutheran pastor, and I want to know where Martin Luther wrote the Bible. Guess what the tour guide said to him? Not part of the tour, sir. Well, we haven't got it very well on camera, but we'll try and show you a little bit. Ja? 
He's on the left there. He is very angry. He is very angry. And so we asked the tour guide, are we going to see any of the heritage sites of Martin Luther? He said, no. Not part of the tour. Can you believe that? Is somebody trying to suppress something? Is the history of the Reformation to be made obsolete? I asked the man, can I take a picture of you? I feel a kinship. <laughs> can I take a picture? He said, sure. And he said, I'll be a rebel with you. <laughs> well, you know, don't judge a person by his coat. This man was a pastor, and he stood up for what he believed, and I appreciate that. I really do. But I hadn't traveled halfway around the world not to see the Lutherstube. And so we went, and we said, we won't want to go in there. And they said, no. We said, yes, we do. And he said, they said, no. He said, yes, we do. We came here to see this place, and we're going to see it. And this is the house where he translated the New Testament. Up the stairs, the tour guide was very upset in this area. But they let us in. There is the Luther Stube. And there is the room in which the Bible was translated. And there is the desk. This desk is a replica above the desk. A picture of his friend, Melanchthon, the mild and gentle, sweet Melanchthon. And you know what struck me? The contrast. It is so apparent. The pomp and the glitter and the mosaics and the absolute magnificence and all the great mosaic depictions of the holy Elizabeth here and the holy Elizabeth there. And then this simplicity. And here in the simplicity, using that vertebra down there of a whale as his footstool. And that's the genuine one that he used, by the way. And a chair which probably wasn't too good for the back. There he stood, and here he lived, and here he did the greatest work that posterity is about to forget. What is this series called? Rekindling the Reformation. I believe the time has come when this message needs to go to the world again and what the Reformers believed must be taught again. So we lodged a formal protest. Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Protestants? Not only that, we must base it on the Bible. So we went to the leadership there and we said, excuse me, we want to know why. We wanted to go to the Wartburg and for one hour we heard nothing but Elizabeth. Oh. Sorry, you couldn't see any of this because this is the 800th birthday of St. Elizabeth. And if you want to come next year, in June, we will have a massive exhibition here of Elizabeth. Has something happened that nobody has noticed? Has something changed? Well, we went to the town. This is the Luther House, Eisenbach. This is where he lived. This is where he taught. There's a little museum. There's nothing worth really looking at inside of it. It's just the building. That's where he was. It's restored nicely, but there's nothing really inside worth watching. This is the little town. And uh, in the same town, you have the home of Johann Sebastian Bach. You know, it's fascinating. When God raised up the Reformation, he didn't only give the Bible back to the people. He didn't only give prophetic insight back to the people, 
But he raised up the greatest composers of the time. And the great hymns of the Reformation today are lying in some dust chamber. Maybe we need to resurrect some of these things. Here is the church where Martin Luther preached. And it says there, Eine feste Burg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. Do you remember that song by Martin Luther? You know, if you read the words of that song today, you'd think, whoa, this cannot be. Nobody would imagine to sing something like that today. And what do we see there today? Graffiti. But not Martin Luther's graffiti. This is modern graffiti on this church. And what is the mindset of the people today? When you look at this, that's what it says. Cots. Do you know what that means? Puke. Puke. It is as if there is a hatred and a disdain for religion. Götzenfresse. What does that mean? That means pagan, false deity, food. But uh, in a bad sense. So, horrible words written over here. And when you're walking outside the posters depicting the times we are living. Domstufen Festspiele, Erfurt 2007. These are the posters. Wherever you go, there's Catholicism. Wherever you go to a heritage site where the Reformation was present, there it is downgraded, degraded, ignored, sidelined, ridiculed. It's time to start a new Reformation. It's time we looked at the Bible and we looked at the prophecies in the Bible as the Reformers looked at the prophecies in the Bible. And let's see whether the signs of the times and the times we are living in conform to the prophecy of the Reformers or are we waiting in vain for something which has taken its place? I would invite you to the next lectures as we start unraveling this mystery and you will be stunned as I was stunned. And believe me, this series is as shocking to me as it might be to you. And this hall is not full enough because people need to know this. And if it's not based on the Bible, what I'm saying, and if it's, you cannot find it in the Word of God, then please warn everyone never to come to my lectures. And if I don't appeal to your mind, then please stay away as well. We want to look at the logic. We want to see whether it is sound exegesis, whether it is Bible-based, and whether it is backed up by modern events prophetically. And why am I doing this? Because the one who is being put down is the Lord and Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. It is not a question of bashing the one and putting the one down. It is more a question of sweeping away the rubbish so that the beauty of the Son of God can shine forth to the world and people can see Him for what He is and make decisions based on what he suffered and what he predicted his people would suffer as well. May God bless you as you contemplate these things. If I've hurt anyone here tonight by what I've said, I profusely apologize. If you want to be angry, be angry with me. But study the Word of God and internalize it. Thank you.